Hello, we are back. We are back again on Loaded Mag. All right, lads, all good? Good, mate. Stephen, Dad, Stephen Boyd. Good, good. Life is good being a Newcastle fan right now. Uh, I I didn't think we'd ever say that. Lads, (laughs) that's that's topical, actually, Pete, because I was going to say October has been my favourite month of the year. Uh, Even though we've not won a game all season, and we're, we're second bottom on the table. Now, feel free to cheer these as I list them. Newcastle takeover completed. Hey. Yay! <laughs> uh, the channel su- subscriber target has been obliterated. Yay! Uh, Bruce is out. Yay! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think, along with my myself, we've just spoken to our first Newcastle player and legend five minutes ago. How does that feel, lads? So, so I think. Class. I think the yeah, it's it's uh it's strange it's strange but um delighted we we started this uh, to get to get to, to do things like this so let's let's bring him out let's introduce it to Warren Barton welcome Warren hi gentlemen how are we Stephen Warren good, mate. good to see you good, well where I am it's good morning and it's sunny so there you go <laughs> <laughs> there you go so, rub it in rub it in yeah October's Hello. been October's been a great month. It really so has, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, I've, I've got to say, Warren, um, massive thank you for you taking the time to come on. Um, I think you had a bit of um, uh, pinball because both me and Martin were, I think, we're messaging <laughs> you at the same time asking if you'd like to come on. So um, you got bombarded by the loaded lads, but um, amazing to, to have you on. You are. As as Dad said before we went on air, the the first uh, legend that we've had on Loaded, um, it's a massive pleasure for all of us uh, uh, um, to have you on, um, and it's just great to have you to talk Newcastle United. So thank you to you. No, it's a, it's a pleasure, uh, and obviously when you, you you asked us to come on, and um, I was getting text messages left, right, and centre. It, it's a pleasure, you know. It's in it's an important part uh, of the role of being an ex player, an ex captain. Um, part of being the entertainers and you know you the fans wherever you are you know whether it's in america ireland england wherever they are in part of the world um i did a, an interview the other day in from saudi arabia so it's it's important that we we keep this momentum going um we know how important the fans are to this club um and for the last couple of years we've had the, the heart and soul ripped out of us but now we're back we're together there's a positivity there's an energy um off the back of a a good point away from home the performance could have been better against crystal palace but we're all we're all optimistic now and that's all we ever want to be you know we've, we've always said we want to be together we want to be looking forward to the games and um we've got a little skip in our slept now so it's it's quite nice it's quite nice watch out we, well the, the thing is we're still in the bottom three but we'll get a conquer the world we've got some optimism exactly yeah the only way is up yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, just just before we get into the the Newcastle United chat, um, I just wanted to ask you. Obviously, you're you're making us all jealous over over there in San Diego. The sun's shining, the weather is sweet. Um, uh, what are you What are you doing over there currently, um, coaching wise? Do you want to just tell us a little bit about what, what's going on over there? Yeah, I made the move. Me and my wife uh, in 2008 to bring the uh, young boys at the time. Uh, just a lifestyle change, you know, to come to the states. Uh, I've just finished my pro license uh, back in the UK. I was able to to do some work with LA Galaxy and their academy uh, for a number of uh, years, and then I was lucky enough to coach my kids. That was a whole point of being with the family. So I've coached them through now, and now they don't need me. They just ask for money and uh, the car key. So uh, <laughs> like everybody parent now, they've. They've gone off and I've been doing media work with with Fox. I was doing that back home in the UK with Sky uh, when I retired in 2005 and, you know, interviewing the likes of David Beckham, as you're showing there, for Sky Sports when he, he bought the franchise in, in Miami. So it was, it was interesting to see David and he was a, a gentleman. And I've been doing the media, whether it's been Premier League, Champions League, World Cups, uh, Bundesliga, uh, MLS. So, you know, I'm enjoying my life over here. But there's always a part of me that, that misses... The, the, the football, as I call it over there, that that feeling that you get walking into the stadium, that feeling that you get for, you know, getting ready for a game and, and watching your team. And I was lucky enough to go back to Newcastle and that picture there was when I was there with my youngest son and we brought a couple of teams over and all the Americans went through St. James's Park and, you know, they was in awe of the stadium. But at the time I did notice how 
a little bit neglected the stadium was and how it had just been left a little bit. And that's where I think the momentum come with myself that even though being over 5,000 uh, miles away, the club looked vulnerable and weak. But, you know, I, I wanted to be, a, you know, part of the uh, the club. And even though, as I said, of working out here and coaching my kids through academy level, uh, I keep a close eye on the Premier League and obviously Newcastle. And, uh, you know, through the pandemic and through the situation of what happened at the club, um, I joined the trust, which was a big part of, you know, trying to get some money and a voice in the club. Um, thankfully now we've got owners that look like they care, uh, which is obviously a big part. And, you know, I'm still invested in a club. I, it was the best seven, eight years of my life, you know, not only playing, but being in that area, being in that region, uh, my kids growing up there, um, you know, the way we was treated as, as, as people. And, you know, I just looked at the club and it felt vulnerable and no one was really saying anything. And then myself got involved, Steve Howie, uh, and then the big man, Alan, you know, you know, uh, endorsed the, the trust. And that's where it's got momentum. You know, we, we started the voice of the fans was starting to be heard. Um, and, you know, it's a club that I love. You know, it goes without saying it's 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 a special, special place with fantastic people. And uh, I'm just so happy for the area, the region and you guys, the fans, because it, you can just tell we all we want to do is, is compete and have a go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we never, ever felt like that in the last couple of years. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I would agree. Uh, it's uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind the, these last few weeks, uh, certainly for us boys, but I can imagine for you, Warren, as well. And look, let's let's get down to it. Um, the takeover. Where were you? Where were you when you found out that the takeover was happening, and what was your initial reaction to it all? Uh, I was uh, I was actually at home, and obviously being a time difference, uh, there was speculation. And, and speaking to George, who's part of the the Trust and Works for the Athletic, um, and actually been speaking to Alan, just just texting about other things, not, not necessarily anything important. Um, and then obviously they started to get momentum that the consortium was in the northeast. Uh, there was, I mean, it was a whirlwind, like you said, within like twelve hours of, of going yeah. to bed, knowing that they was in there to say it has been confirmation we're just waiting for the premier league to put it through um was so exciting but i, I was in san diego uh, i didn't sleep that night if i'm being totally honest i think i even did something for sky at two o'clock in the morning for me just a, an interview yeah. to be you know where was the club where what would happen and you know just you know it was fellas as well it wasn't just realizing that we was going to get an ownership that was passionate about the team and about the club it was about their, their vision and their idea and the wealth that they had. So it was like mind blowing. It was like not only when Sir John Hall took over that he was buying David Ginola, he was buying David Batty, Tino Asprey, Alan Shearer, Les Ferdinand. This takes us possibly, if it's done right, to the promised land, you know, to, to that next level of, of winning something. And I think that's the thing that we we recognize. And, you know, it's just the little things like the, the recognition about the academy the stadium, you know, cleaning the windows. I know it's, people are laughing at me when I said that, but it was the little things like that. It was the little things yeah. that they cared about and spoke about the women's team. We're going to invest in them. It wasn't just, oh, we're going to buy uh, Mbappe and Haaland and that's it. <laughs> we all want that. <laughs> we all want that. Yeah. But it was the other things that went with it. And just to see it, you know, snowball and generate. And I just remember the last like hour thinking, I was always looking at my phone, social media. Why? How comes it's not been okay by the Premier League? And then it was like 30 minutes. So it must be coming through now. And then to actually see it and just relief was the first thing I felt. Relief about it. And then it was like excitement. And then it was the text messages, the social media and our clubs back. And Newcastle's social media. I don't know whether you've noticed how that's changed. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? How that's changed. And, that was a, and that's a big, big part of it. You know, we're united again. We're, and they've obviously been suppressed by not allowed to do that. And that's... That's disgusting from my point of view. You know, you've got to promote the club, the fans and ex-players and people in the community and, you know, fans that have, have done great things in the great North run and everything was just pushed aside. Um, but now we've got a, we, we, we've got a hope and we've got a dream. And I think like we've got a vision. I think we all, we've all got the same vision of like, yeah, they're going to do it properly. They're going to do it. And they're going to make mistakes. But let's, you know, let's not be naive and thinking everything's going to be, you know, Disneyland and it's all going to work out. There's going to be mistakes. There's going to be bumps along the road. But at least you've got people that care and actually 
want to do the right things for the club and have the identity and that that the you know the fans are the heart and soul of that club and that club is the heart and soul of that city so if you've got it together you've got half a chance of of doing well i mean the atmosphere for the spurs game for the uh, you know it reminded me of the good old days you know what i said to the players i had that for seven years yeah we had a couple with rude hullet and you know it wasn't great but by and large they knew, all right, forget who was in the dugout, but when you have Kevin Keegan and Sir Bobby Robson, you had the mixture of both. And when you have Alan Shearer, Gary Speed, Rob Lee, you know, as I said, Lauren Robert, you know, Shea Given, the list goes on and on and on, players that was out there and Ginola and the list of them was, you know, you can go on and on. There was a real buzz um, and they knew that we cared. So I just want the players to feel that like I felt because I'm never going to get that back again. I try, but I'm never going to get it. I'm too old. But uh, it, it, it's it's lovely. It's lovely. It's lovely. What they say, it's better to have loved than to never love at all. So I, yeah. I've had that. So I, I've had that. I, I think for me, I know. Sorry, I joined late. So uh, first of all, Warren, really nice oh, to I meet did. you, and thanks for thanks for coming on. <laughs> I know I'm I'm, I'm kind of like Warren. I'm working on a different time zone at the minute. So I'm in Ireland, but I'm opening up a new distribution center. So um, we thought you'd left. Like, I know. I thought I would. I, know, I, I, I tried. I tried. I've been trying to get on Gallagher shots, but nobody will have me. So yeah, there you go. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to ask Warren. For me, one of the things that that I want to see with the with these players and the next batch of players come through is what you were talking about, which is, you know, you you came to the northeast, you know, not from the area, but you had that pride in the shirt and the club, and you know, you still have it in absolute bloody bucket loads still which is amazing to see how do we get the current crop of players and the next batches of players to have that same pride in the shirt that you and 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 the, the guys had back you know back in the day it comes from the top you know when i was there sir john hall um obviously was a big big voice of the club kevin keegan Obviously, it's in, it was ingrained in us. And then you had the players, Steve Watson, Steve Howie, Lee Clark, you know, all these, Pedro, Peter Beersley. It was ingrained to us. Uh, and the fans, you know, that connection of, of training and having four or 5,000 fans watching you train at Maiden Castle. Um, but it come from the top and it comes from the players. And I said about Sam Maximan, he, if he thinks he's actually adored now, you know, with, with these circumstances, he has got no idea of what it can be like. And I'm not saying you play the game for that, but to have that uh, respect and that that passion and that wave of energy behind you, you know, that you, you can imagine walking down the steps and coming out and knowing that you've got 52,000 screaming Geordies behind you. I mean, if that don't lift you, nothing else will do. And that, But it, it come from within and the captain would know, you know, Wilson will know. Having players, ex-players around. I'm not saying this is not a job interview, by the way. But having people around <laughs> to to let them know what possibly could happen. If you do this, I, listen. I wasn't the most gifted. I was never, but I tried. And when I walked out of there in 2002, 2003, when Bobby said, "Listen, we we you've done great for us. We're going to move you on." At the time, it killed me, but he was right. I walked out. I'd given everything. I'd given anything that I could for the club and I went off to Derby County and tried to do the same for them. But I, for them, that time that I was at Newcastle playing over 200 games, I'd given them everything on and off the field. And they appreciated that, uh, the, the, the fans. And as I said, you know, I wasn't Alan Shearer or David Ginoda or Les Ferdinand, these type of players, or even Rob Lee and, and Speedo. But I was I was there with them and I was part of it all. And uh, we, we had a great time uh, on and off the field. And to have that that understanding of what it means to give that to the next generation of players is important. You know, my thing to give it to Aaron Hughes, Kieran Dyer, Craig Bellamy, um, Andy Griffin, you know, then it was Shea was in there. You know, Shea was only a young player coming through. That was our role uh, as a player. Like if there was a kid outside Wakenville, you signed it. If you was, you know, going asked to do a school presentation on a Thursday night, you did it. And you didn't do it because you had to. You did it because you wanted to do it. All these type of things come within the club. And that's because you play for a special club. And the fans understand that. They know they're going to work the next day saying, oh, Warren Barton was talking to my, my son the other day and gave him an offer. You know, for us, it's 30 seconds of your time. To other people, it means the world to them. Um, of course, yeah. And if we get that back, and we will, I think, with this ownership and with the new identity, because it got so low. It got so depressing. Um 
that the the way that the Geordies were is that we ain't having this no more. We're going to fight for whatever we think, and that's where we've nearly run two hundred thousand pounds that's going to go to Northeast Charities that you know through the trust. The players now understand doing interviews coming forward, and then you go into the community and you know looking at the people, and that is a wave of emotion that you can't generate anywhere anywhere else. I think that's one of the reasons why you, what you're saying there about having people from the top all the way down. I think one of the the most positive things they can probably do is bring some possibly back of the entertainer era is it like an ambassador role like they mentioned Kevin Keegan uh, Alan some way or some, some more people from the entertainers era even possibly yourself Warren do you know what I mean but people who get the club who can you know sell the club to overseas players to who could also sell it to you know people who live down south as well because obviously you 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 bridged that gap coming from the south to the north you got that gap because there's always been sometimes that stigma around why would you want to go and play for Newcastle? But it's like, you, you, do you know what I mean? It's like you, you see quite a lot of even pundits nowadays saying, why, what's Newcastle got to attract them? Obviously, part of it, they always think it's, it's money now because of the takeover. But we know, and you know, because you've worn the shirt, what this team can be like. And do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's getting across to the players that possibly could be coming up. Yeah, I, I'll tell you a couple of things. First of all, them pundits ain't got a clue. So they, they might go up to Newcastle for a weekend. They don't I'll drink to that. Them. Yeah, they don't understand. It. You know, that's that's just pure ignorance. You know, they, every city, every place, whether it's Leeds, Liverpool, you know, the, Newcastle, they're no different. You know, London, listen, I'm from London, live there and I'm proud of it. But there's some great places all over England. And you go there to, to play your football and where you're, you know, you go to work and where you feel like you're going to work for... Um, for a purpose, it's not just a job. It's going there because you know you've got responsibilities of the people, the city. We embrace that, the players. When I met Kevin Keegan in a hotel in London, and you know, I normally don't say too much about what happened behind closed doors, but Kevin's coming, and I was like, Arsenal was interested in me, Celtic at the time, Man City. There was, there was quite a few clubs that was interested. Kevin said to me, "Come and join a big club," and that's all he had to say. He just said, "It's a big club, and we're going to challenge." And there was that that was the that was the only thing. It wasn't like come for the money, we're gonna sell he wasn't selling me anything. He just said, Come and join a big club. And I remember on the February before I signed, I was doing a call down for Wimbledon at the time. And at the time St. James Park was only thirty six thousand people. And I was doing a call down with a good friend of mine at the time, Robbie Earl. And I said, Imagine playing for this lot. Imagine playing in front of this stadium and playing. And then lo and behold, four months later, to but you're right, to to speak to players and say it's not only that you're playing in the best league in the world, arguably one of the best atmospheres in world football in that stadium. When that place is going, it's as good as anything in the world uh, and the, the teams that we have. The area where you're going to live, you know, there's not too many places where you, you're going to be adored just by playing for that club. And I'm not saying players do it. Modern players are different and, you know, everybody's got an ego and wants to do well and a bit of privacy here and there. But to, to have that responsibility, like me, Rob, Alan, Gary, when we we relish that opportunity to have that responsibility, we we did it and ingrained it. So yeah, that's part of the job uh, title. It's so not only you play for Newcastle, but you're an ambassador. You represent the club. You're you're there as a role model for the kids that are at school that are watching you. So that would be what you would have to say. You know, money will talk, and the Premier League does that, uh, and the money that will come with it. I remember even Chelsea, you know, when they started off with the Abramovich time, they had to overspend and buy players and bring players in because everybody knew they had money. Now, we had even, what was great when I looked at it, you looked at Chelsea, they had like 17 billion, Man City, 26 billion. We've got 300 billion. (laughs) It's insane. (laughs) It's insane. So, you know, not saying they're all going to give it to us, but we've got got a fighting chance to bring, you know, someone in. So you're, you're right. Identify the players, you know, a technical director, sporting director, identify the players, go and speak to their agent. Yeah, you know, money is money. There's no doubt. Most Salah <clears throat> wants half a million pounds a week to, to play for Liverpool. You know, he's won everything. So he, he, it's about the money at the end of the day, as much as he loves the club and everything else. But if you can tell these players what, what they possibly you could get and what will happen. I mean, listen, they love us in, in Newcastle for the entertainers. We didn't win anything. Imagine, <laughs> imagine if they won something. Oh, you know, yeah. what I mean? imagine yeah, you know it. we come twice, uh, second twice in, in the years with, with with KK, and you know, imagine if this lot won it, and and the expectation and the the enthusiasm that would be around the place is it, it, something to be withhold. You could never get that anywhere else. Yeah. Um, 
So that's the take what I Sorry. The takeover mightn't have gone through then, Warren, though, because that's but that that's a kind of another factor for, for the, the takeover of Newcastle. It's it's uh, to, to try and win something something with a club that has been so hungry for so long. The 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 desire mightn't have been from from the, the consortium to take over you. So so may, maybe it's a good thing you didn't win, that Warren. You could look at it that way. It's been it that way. <laughs> there, there is no bloody good way that we didn't win. No, I'm, no trying, I'm trying. I'm trying, Warren. Not, no <laughs> there was a positive after that season, so <laughs> we we let what, you I, down. We failed. So I apologise. No, I, I, I think the other. Not. I think the other good thing is that when Warren met KK in a hotel in London, he didn't do what he did to Robbie Lee, which is tell him that Newcastle yeah. was closer than Middlesbrough. Yeah, but I, listen, I've got a brain. I've got a brain. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone knows Rob Lee, it's a look outside this bubble. You know, that's the problem with Rob. He doesn't know. So, but he still Rob, you're nice. welcome on the show anytime. Uh, yeah, Rob, um, yeah, come on and join us. And, and, yeah, yeah. Deny that story in total, yeah. Yeah. It's send um, you to sleep. It's send you to sleep. Do it by bedtime. It'll be fine. Warren, I've got I've got a question for you, and it's it's a picture picture related question. So you've heard that we're on the lookout for a manager, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to kind of go with a hypothetical question. So during your time in, in Newcastle, you you played under under a number of different managers. So of these four managers, who would you? pick to kick off the projects that and and bearing in my mind 19th position in the league uh and a bit of a bit of a task ahead of us and all the rebuilding that needs to be done all over the place who would you pick to uh and why to, to lead that revolution so bobby robson without a shadow of a doubt you know kenny was was great you know got us into the champions league and the fa cup kk is, is a legend but so bobby rude was rude so we, we don't really have to go there. Yeah, that was the trick one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a look second and think, who was that? <laughs> uh, but so Bobby, if you remember... That was you in all of them, by the way. Yeah, if, <laughs> if, if you remember when uh, Sir Bobby took over, um, we was going nowhere. You know, this sexy yeah. football was, was, was not happening. Uh, Alan was coming to his wits end. You know, he, he didn't know whether to, to stay or go. His heart was saying stay, but his mind was saying, well, I, I'm not going to be, I'm never going to, you know, I'm not playing for this guy. It, it got really, really tough. Um, and so we just dug in. Um, and then so Bobby come in on the, on the Wednesday, he, he got given the job. And the first thing he did is obviously just call a meeting beforehand. And he just asked Alan in front of everybody, why do you keep coming towards the ball? And Alan being Alan said, well, that idiot told me to come short and play sex, sexy football. So Bobby went, face that way and score goals. We play Sheffield Wednesday, beat him 8-0. He gets five goals. And that gives us that, <laughs> that momentum and that belief. And then what Sir Bobby started to do was obviously identify where we needed with Kieran, with Craig Bellamy, going with Pace. Aaron Hughes started bringing them in. Lauren Robert, uh, Kevin Gallagher, we bought him for half a million pounds. And Kevin got us into that top half of the table because he could play in different areas. He started working on the academy. He started working on um, the feel-good factor in the club. He got that club around the scruff of the neck and took him into it. Within two years, we was back in the Champions League. Mm-hmm. So it can be done. You know, all yeah. this talk about it's going to take us four or five years is a load of cobble. You know, it's a, I would say something else, but it can be done with the right person because Bobby <laughs> understood exactly tactically what we needed to do. He knew he had Shea Given, Nikos Stabizas, who was arguably one of the most underrated players at Newcastle. We called him we, we called him the Kaiser because he thought it was Franz Beckenbauer, but he was actually <laughs> he, he thought he was, but we knew he wasn't. But he, Nick, Nikos was great. You know, Nikos did a job. You had Gary Speed, you had Rob Lee and you had Al. So you, you and myself. So you, he called us the blue chip players. And then around that he put the other players around, started grooming them in, start, didn't throw Kieran in straight away, didn't throw Craig Bellamy in straight away, Aaron Hughes, uh, Andy Griffin. He started dipping them in. They'd had a chance with Rude and then they had to wait. Then we started winning games and then he got rid of me, got rid of Rob, started bringing other players in. Mm-hmm. And then, as I said, he got us in the Champions League and, uh, and where we was competing to, with you know, going down to Highbury and beating them 3 1 and, and places like that where, yeah. you know, against the Invincibles and, and teams like that. Yeah. So, you know, he got his back. So, from my point of view, <clears> so Bobby was it get, gave me so much knowledge of the game, but also gave me so much understanding of what being a, a man is about, you know, how to conduct yourself as a person. If you, you know, I was like a sponge with him. I had times where I would sit on on the on the uh, bus, and there'd be Stuart Pearce, Peter Beardsley, Ian Russ, and uh, and John Barnes. So I'd be sitting with them, 
this is a kid that got told twice, you're too small, you're never going to make it. I was like a sponge with their information. And then I, the next day, so Bobby came in. Like, the others are all gone because they, you know, as I said, we, we moved on. So I'd sit with Bobby and talk about the game. And he was just brilliant. He, he would just give me so much knowledge and, and just simple things, but effective things. And, and, and all of them did in their own way. To be fair to Rude Hullet, his understanding of the football being Dutch, it's not much, all that business was, was, was great. And Kenny Elgleish about how he was and KK. But when you think of a package of all of them, Bobby ticked every single box that you needed. Um, and again, it was it was it was wrong what happened to him at the end. Uh, I don't think it would have happened if me and Rob were still there at the club, but it, it happened. Um, but he, he got that club back where it wanted to be, which was competing. Just following on as a second part of that, uh, Warren. Do you think Sir Bobby could do it with this set of players, though? Because obviously the set of players that he had when he came in the last time, that squad, there was it was a good squad. Do you think he would be able to achieve it with this squad of players? Yeah, I think he could do I think the keeper, it seems a good and the captain. I think you look at the midfield, um, that, that they've got players that can play. Wilson is a scorer. He, listen, he ain't Alan Shearer. There's only one of them. And I was lucky enough to have six years with Alan. Um, so there's only one of them. But there's enough in that team that he would tactically get. And he would have man management so well. Um, and I, I'll tell you a quick story about man management with Kevin Keegan. Uh, we, we was playing, I think it might have been Spurs away. And it, it, it wasn't going great at the moment. And Les struggled a little bit with his back sometimes. And um, I, I was playing right back. And I could hear Kevin saying... Uh, Les keeps looking at me. Les wants to like maybe come off because of his back sore. He's a little bit sore at the moment with his back. And Kevin went to Terry Mack. And I could just hear because I was taking the throw. And he went, don't keep looking at him because he want to come off. Les went and scored two goals. And that was man management. He went, don't keep looking at Les. Keep looking over here and coaching the team. Because Les will want to maybe like, Gaffer, it's a bit sore. We're, we're back. He just left him. And that was man management. And it's the same with, with, with Sir Bobby. You know, it was like, he didn't used to ask him if he was okay, like Speedo or Rob Lee. He never, he never asked us if we was all right. But it makes sure Laura Mavell was okay. It makes sure Bellas was okay. It makes sure Patrick Clivert was okay or whoever it may be. But he just left us and we was all right. We were getting on with it. But I think he'd have the same mindset with these players and understand what makes them tick. Uh, and he'd organise them a lot better at the back line. It makes sure they was fitter uh, training as well. There won't be... You know, so many days off, uh, which is a good thing that we've seen straight away. We've got a big game against Chelsea. Uh, we're going to get... And that doesn't mean when you come into training, you run and run and run. Because I had this conversation with someone about, you know, giving players days off. They need to... Re Sometimes you just can go in, you can have a walk and a stretch, you can watch a video, get out of the house and then go back. But it's the... That's perception of having a day off. It's like, well, you've got a massive game against Spurs. It's all coming up. Why on earth are we having a day off? You know, you, you should want to be training. We would, me, Speedo and that, we, we lived near each other. Our kids was the first one to be dropped off at school. We didn't even stop. We just threw them out of the car. <laughs> we, wanted to get, we wanted to get to the training ground and be with the boys and get ready for the next game. So um, that's the type of culture you want to bring back yeah. to the club. I think just following on briefly on that one, with you saying about, obviously, a goalkeeper and Wilson there, I think the other part that really needs to be addressed in the, in the January window is we need to bring a spine back to the team. So, who would you realistically target for those positions? Because I think, obviously, goalkeeper, I think we're probably stocked in the goalkeeper department for this moment in time. We still need a, a recognised centre-forward to compete with and as a backup for Wilson. But we haven't got a, re like a realistic spine bar that. So, who would you think that, or in your opinion, or the consultant's opinion, who would you target for that spine? Uh, uh, very much like, so probably, I'd have players that have, of, of expert like Sterling, I said straight away. You know, he's not playing regular at City. Do we maybe need that type of player? But you need experienced players. You know, you, you need someone like. Um, I'd look at Chelsea's roster and think, but right, who's in and around there but want to understands what's going on that want to come and join Newcastle. Uh, also, you know, I do a lot of work in the Bundesliga in Liga, and then you you see players, you think. You know what, if they're given a chance, they can blossom and do well. No one really heard of Nikos Dabizas when he first came to the club. And, yeah. you know, when he when he came along or, you know, David came along for two million and, and, and what a player he turned out to be. So I think you're absolutely right. There's not just one area. We need to have stronger depth. We need to have stronger depth. And my type of player would be 
I know it's a little bit going against Sterling, but I still think that quick, athletic and, and younger. I think that's the mindset and the model that we want to go with players. You know, a, a Haaland is the epitomise of what you would want to see because he's, he's strong, he's quick, he scores goals, he's hungry. They're the type of players that you want to bring in. You might have to bridge a gap to get them in like a lot of clubs yeah. have done to get that stability. And then if it's not working, you can sell them on and go forward. So there's enough players, I think, that would be out there and relish the opportunity to be at the beginning of something special. You know, when go back to Kevin Keegan, when he spoke to Philip Albert, Rob Lee, Peter Beersley, when he brought them back and said, look, we're building something special here. Do you want to be part of it? You need to have them characters around. So, as I said, I think there's a nucleus of players there. And I think if you bring these experienced players in, it will lift the confidence and the belief for the players that you've got in the club. And then start looking about younger players, start bringing them in um, longer down the line. But initially, it's get that that players that know that to, to win your games, to, to give you that little bit of explosive differentness uh, and style of play that you can bring to the club. You've um, you mentioned, obviously, that you've, you've looked at a number of the European leagues because you, you, you cover them as well. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about um, the Premier League clubs. Obviously, they're up and against Newcastle at, at the moment after the takeover. And there's been a lot of talk of them stopping um, Newcastle signing some of their players. Um, if that was the case, I don't believe it would be, but if that was the case and we had to go into some of those European leagues to, to sign a couple of players in January, whether it was the Bundesliga, Liga, uh, La Liga, Serie A, is there any players that, that have caught your eye from your observations that you think, you know what, they could come and do a job at Newcastle 100%? Yeah, there's no doubt. You know, the Bundesliga is always a great avenue. You know, Goretzka, uh, the kid there. And I know he's playing for Bayern Munich and people are going to yeah. say, why would you leave Bayern Munich come here? Schürrle, the big centre-half. There's players mm. there. I looked at Dortmund, mm. you know, Leipzig. You know, uh, you know there's some there's some players there that I looked at. Um, you know, there, there is some quality players out there to, to, to go and bring in. I think that's... I mean, how... Didn't the top six go and have a private meeting that they was going to block everything up? The Premier League let down a law of a guideline of what the new consortium should do. We ticked every single box. We worked hard to do that. The Premier League has given us... It's not down to then another 18, six clubs to say, well, no, actually, we're going to tell the Premier League what to do. I know they're members and they have a voice, but we we, we did that at the beginning and we've, we've got through. So what on earth gives them the right? But I understand there is enough players in the foreign market you know, I do Liga MX. There's some players out there that I've seen that, that, that do well, that could come in, um, you know, whether it's at, um, at Chivas or the other players that are around there. You, I think what, what happens as well a little bit in the Premier League, and not, not that I think, I know what happens, because you've got the money, you get lazy. You don't go out and do your job, due diligence, and look at players and find out about them and go and watch them. You know, just sit there saying, oh, I know an agent in Spain, go and buy me that kit. You no, know, go out and do your job. That's where a technical director director of football would be good, you know, that you respect. When I was doing my pro licence, we went out to Holland and Germany to see what that role was. And, the, the, you know, I remember having it in England and speaking to people in England saying, well, the problem is the technical director wants the manager's job. Over there, it's not. They, they pride themselves on being a technical director. I would pride myself in saying, right, I'm going to identify seven or eight players. Look what Les Ferdinand's done with QPR, getting rid of all that that he had to, and now he's got them back challenging mm -hmm. Because he's gone out and done his homework, he's looked around, he, he works 15, 18 hours a day trying to bring people into a club that he, he understands. And now you're starting to see the rules. So if you go out and do your job, uh, then you've got a chance to be successful. Because there's, you know, the players that you're looking at, you're trying to identify, it doesn't take a rocket science to say, you know what, he ain't a bad player. He's, he's got, you know, you can see him for 30 minutes, the way he runs, the way he moves, his body shape, his, his decision making that he makes. You know, maybe then you go and watch him again away from home. Then you go and do a little bit of homework about what he's like as a person, what's he got going forward. And then you put that proposal to the to the board or to the ownership to go and do that. So, you know, you, you have to do what you have to do. And, you know, that's what the ownership did for 18 months. They went away. They got told no. They did their homework. They did what they needed to do. Then they put a proposal and, you know, 48 hours later, they're, they're, they've owned arguably one of the best clubs in, in the country. So, you know, it, it can be done on, on both streams. I think it's well, quite... Uh, oh, but, go on. Sorry, go on. Uh, sorry Mitch. I was, I, was, I was just going to ask well, one. Well, I've, well, I've, I've got like 100 questions to ask you, Adam, but <laughs> I've, got, I've chilled it down to two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask, who was, who was um, the most difficult opponent you faced 
And also, who did you enjoy playing with the most, you know, on, on your team? Um, the most, Saddam, when we played against him as an out-and-out player, he was like head and shoulders at the time. I mean, obviously, week in, week out was Ryan Giggs. You know, not only was he a, a fantastic player and he was hardworking and he was gifted, but he played for a really, really good team. P uh, Terry Henry is the best player, I think, to have ever played in the Premier League. So, playing against Terry, and he always used to come onto his left-hand side, my yeah. right-hand side. And I remember saying, I played against him a few times when he was at Monaco um, as well. And then when he came to, to Arsenal, and we'd met a couple of times on social events when we'd been out there. And I remember saying to him a few times at Highbury, listen, my, my, my wife and kids are here with a game. Do you mind going over to Bez on the other side? <laughs> he went, yes, Mr. Newcastle, no problem. And they're going to terrorise John Beresford for 20 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he would be ultimately yes. the best. Um, I really enjoyed playing with Norberto Solano. I was lucky when I first went, Foxy was at the club, the Royal Fox, and he was a, a tremendous little player. Keith Gillespie, we had a really good understanding. It was quite simple with Keith. Put it in front of him, he was quick and he would whip it in. But playing and the Nobby would come inside and then he'd roll me the ball outside or he'd use my run and, and put a nice little ball in himself. And as a person, as a fellow, he, he, he was great. Yeah. Um, Playing the trumpet at eleven o'clock at night when we was at away games was was always quite amusing. So, Nobby was the best you know, close person. Obviously, Robley and Speedo uh, being mm -hmm. being with them and, and Alan and, and things like that. But you know, having a good relationship with Nobby, um, I think we complement each other quite well, um, and we had a good understanding. But you know, I was lucky enough to play with some 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 wonderful players and uh, not too many bad players. Uh, lucky enough at, at Newcastle at the time. There was one or two, and one of them was a Brazilian. He was fucking useless. But, Who was the one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to know. It won't, be, it, won't on, be, it won't be fair if I said it. It won't be fair. <laughs> he only played once, and I think that says it all. It yeah, was the only, you know, was the only Brazilian you know, that could, yeah, he couldn't control the ball. It was it was a mind blow. But he was a lovely fella. He was a lovely fella. But <laughs> he, was, he was fucking useless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. <laughs> Um, you talked. You talked um, before Warren about the the game when Alan wasn't scoring the the um, the Sheffield Wednesday game, and I I was actually in the car heading to Manchester Airport to fly to Spain, and we had that match on the radio. I was in the car with five Mac, with well, four Mackams, um, and we were heading, so I had a really good time. But there was some there was some talk. I heard some talk and, and probably rumours and, and stories. But pre Bobby Robson coming in. Was there any truth to the factor that Alan was had met with Liverpool and was close to maybe leaving Newcastle? Was there anything in that at all? I think he was close to saying that his time was up at Newcastle. I'd, I'd not heard about Liverpool. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me because I think every club would have wanted Alan. Um, even I think Sir Alex would have bit his pride and gone for Alan at the time because he's, he's just a goal-scoring machine and a top-class player and a, a great professional. So I'd never heard of that about Liverpool but it wouldn't surprise me because obviously he lived in that area when he was at Blackburn um, and, and knew uh, the chance but he, he was so another story and I hope Alan doesn't mind me saying it but we was doing at uh, Chesley Street we was doing a little bit of set pieces uh, the day before the game against Sunderland and Alan and it was at that time fans was allowed to come and watch uh, and we were doing some set pieces and Alan had put a yellow bib on and, and we was all on, say, I think it was green at the time, so the, the first team players, the ones that was going to start. And I said to her, what, what are you doing? Why, why is Clarky, like Steve Clark, give you that? He went, I'm not playing. I said, you're fucking joking, aren't you? I said, we're playing Sunderland. <laughs> you know, there's it's one player that's going to play, it's you. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, all the others, maybe we can all get dropped, but not you. He went, no, he's, I, I ain't involved. So I was like, this is, this is. so we went in to see Rude. There was me, uh, Steve and uh, Howie and, and, and um, Speedo and said, Gaffer, what's, what's going on? He said, I'm not playing him. I said, you've got, you've got to play him. He's, 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 we're playing them. He went, no, no, he's not. And this is my... I said, well, it's on your fucking head then. Do you know what I mean? It's because you've got, got to play him. And Alan was really distraught. Uh, not only, obviously, his personal pride. No one likes being left out. But the way it was done. You know, the way he wasn't even consulted. He wasn't even... And Rude's line, when I asked him that, said, well, no one told me at AC Milan. And I went... You never got dropped to AC Milan. No one ever dropped you. So you, no one had to tell you. I said, at least give the decency. And he went, no, no one ever told me. So that's how toxic it got. And Alan's a friend of mine. Rob Lee as well and, and Stuart Pierce are training with the kids two miles away. So they're not even, and Nick Ostabby's there. So they're not even near us. So that's how it got. And then um, 
obviously he was really hurt about that and he started thinking and I think Alan's mentioned it himself like maybe this is the end of the road all that I yeah. wanted to do in my boyhood dream to be here is now being cut down by a coach who doesn't who doesn't value me so yeah. I'll have to go and learn my trade somewhere else um but I don't want to say this because but thankfully he did get beat and he got the sacked <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history yeah. do you know what I mean and exactly. was, I, think that, that, I, think I was at that game that night I think there was Ferguson and Alan was on the bench that night yeah yeah, yeah. Was, you, was, another quick, last rain Phillips another, and Quinn scored and a, another quick story so obviously them two was on the bench and <clears> we was always getting into training early them two was a training at 7 30 8 o'clock waiting outside the manager's door he was already on the flight going good job because them two would have killed him because Fergie <laughs> Fergie was unhappy because Rude had come out and said well when I put them two on we was winning and that's that was another thing but before they could even get their hands on him Rude had already jumped on the plane and, and gone because uh, them two was waiting at Chesley Street to speak to the manager at 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning after the game so I wouldn't like to be rude if them two come flying through the door because <laughs> they can both look after themselves imagine. yeah yeah um, lads, listen, I'm going to go because I'm going to go grab a shower. My earpods are dying. Uh, Warren, absolute pleasure to meet you, mate. Thanks very much for coming on. Um, no, I'm sure pleasure. we'll catch up again at, at, at some other time. Lads, no I'll watch the rest of the show later on. Enjoy the rest of it. And, Take uh, care, Mark. Take care, Mark. Take care, Mark. The rest. No worries. Great to meet you, Warren. Thanks, Pleasure. Mate. Good luck to you. See you, mate. Bye-bye. Who was that guy? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never saw him before. Uh Warren, a quick question, and, and I know we have loads of questions in the chat, and I promised people we were going to get to them as well. Um, we talked about signings there a few minutes ago, um, and let's let's concentrate on your 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 uh, position r- right back. Um, who would you res- realistically think we could sign? And I'm going to give you two names: um, uh, Tarek Lamptey from from uh, Brighton, who had a brilliant season last season. He's, he's was injured at the start of this season. He hasn't really got back into the Brighton squad yet. And the guy that's come to, to Southampton from Chelsea, uh, uh, Livermore, uh, Livermore Mento, sorry. And Livermento, his first name, yeah. his Livermento. first name is Livermento. yeah. His, <laughs> his first name is Tino. So would that be brilliant on the back of a jersey? I think. Oh, so, <laughs> so uh, any suggestions yourself? Yeah, I mean, I again, Hakimi, when he came out from Dortmund, when I oh. thought you know, that was going to happen, he's a player that I would have loved to have seen. Um, yeah, but you're right, both two young players. I mean, the, the, the player at the moment at the right back, he, he's a solid player. You know, yeah, yeah, we might need to add, but is it essential that we get a right back? Because I think he, could, he does a solid job. I think he's a good player. Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't necessarily, that's not an area I think immediately, oh, we've got to go and strengthen at that fullback position. The, the two players that you mentioned would be great for the future. Um, but, you know, you know, I'm looking at someone, as I said, like Akimi, where I thought, well, yeah, you know, well, like he would suit the mindset, the understanding of the club. Um, I've, I've seen him at Dortmund when he's played and obviously at PSG, he's playing there and, and doing well. Another thing, could you get him? But he had a clause in his contract at Dortmund. We might have missed that one, but yeah, it wouldn't be an area that I think we have to address immediately would be a, a, as a right back. No, um, that's fair enough, Warren. I just wanted to ask Warren. Um, a few, a few lads in the in, in the chat have mentioned it as well. There's there's been quite a bit, um, a bit of talk about uh, Connor Cody, who's um, linked, has been linked with us recently. Now he was very complimentary talking about Newcastle um, in an interview. I think it might have been last week. Um, talking about how big of a club we are, um, how great the club is. Um, you know, Wolves are not pulling up any many trees at the moment. So certainly not, not like they were when they first came into the Premier League. They, they they took the Premier League by storm at the beginning. But you know, would would you suggest someone in January like him potentially yes. coming in and, and making it uh, you know really solidifying the the, the defensive line? Yeah, I, I would do. Uh, obviously he's an England international, he's not a regular. Uh, I, I mean that would be but what I like about Connor is his personality. He's, he's not frightened to say things, the right things. He's always vocal with the media, you know, which is important to be part of that. One, he's a good player, but secondly, and he's a leader. You know, he's a leader of that when he's played three at the back or two at the back. Going back to what I originally said is to get players that understand the Premier League, whether it was... So you can imagine, say, um, the left. we get a left back, you get Conor Cody, you get Sterling, you get another couple of other players. You're thinking, hold on a minute, we've got four or five good signings there to build on whatever we've got. And Conor Cody would be would be one of them. So yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big fan of his. I'm a big fan of him on the field, but I, I'm a big fan of him off the field. I think he's yeah. got a, a good personality, a good a good appetite for the game. Um, 
and he's right. We are a big club. Wolves is a fantastic football club, but we're Newcastle. You know, we're we're a, we're a, a big club, and I think he would be, he would relish that responsibility of being a player at Newcastle, uh, and and actually relish wearing that shirt and look look forward to it and wear it with a bit of pride. I think he gets that from his Liverpool question because I always associate Liverpool being very similar to Newcastle, yeah. um, and I think that's why he would suit Newcastle to a T. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the fans of Newcastle and Liverpool have the right understanding. And, and, and the, uh, the Blue Nose as well, the Evertonians, they have that understanding. But particularly Liverpool people, they're, you know, we, we had Terry McDermott, who, who was a, we were at the club for a long while, and had that same mindset. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. You know, someone like him would, would, would be great. Cool. Uh, maybe we'll go to a few of the questions. Jump in, lads, a few of other questions as well you want to go with. But uh, yeah, from Colin Wilson, he's asking about uh, St. James's Park and uh, w um, about, I suppose, what's your view around if we get further down the line and the, the new owners, would they consider a extending St. James's Park uh, or a, a new stadium? Or what, what, would be, what would your view be on that one? Having played there for many years. I mean, how, how, how lovely it is to, to speak about the stadium getting bigger. You know, when we was there, there was a 10-year waiting list of 10,000 people trying to get tickets to get into the club. That's even when they built the tier. You know, again, if you would have said the Tottenham game two weeks beforehand, you couldn't give tickets away. People was giving tickets away. They didn't want to be there. So that just shows you what's transformed uh, over recent weeks. Um, it's always St James's part to me. When I was working in the media, I got told off by my boss, it's, you've got to call it the sports director. I said, no, 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 no. To me, it's James's part. He went, no, it's got to be. I went, no, I'm calling it. Get rid of me then, because, you know, that's what I call it. It's the James's part. Um, so that will always be the same. Um, I think it's it's a, a beacon of light when you when you go in the train station or when you come off the motorway and you go into Newcastle. It's, it's the first thing you see. It's there. It, could we build on it on certain areas and develop it maybe higher and take the roof off a little bit? Uh, no doubt. You've seen what's happened at Anfield, how they've done it there, but still kept the, the history and tradition. Um, what it needed and what it's getting at the moment is a bit of TLC inside the yeah. stadium. So when the sta people walk in the stadium, it feels like their football club, not like it's this empty shell that you're walking into. Um, and that's starting already. But St. James's and St. James's and... What a lovely position to be in that we could start building and renovating it and, uh, and moving it up because it's it's such a, a iconic stadium uh, across the world, not just in the in the Premier League. Do you think it could work with the name and rights though? Just because I, I I live in Chesley Street myself and we've got the cricket the Durham County Cricket Ground down there, which would be familiar to yourself when you were training yeah. down there yourself. But obviously that that was always the Riverside, but now they've they've renamed it the Emirates Riverside. So do you think it could work something like Aramco St James's Park or Saudi S and James's Park, rather than just getting rid of St James's Park altogether? Yeah, and also I think it's a different mindset now. People will understand why it's being changed, not because of this yeah. like mm. disrespect or disregard <clears throat> to the history and the club itself. I think there would be a different mindset, and I think the ownerships would would ask around and say, "Look, listen, you're not going to please everybody. You know, if you do change it, it's like Highbury when it left. You know, people's like, you don't want to leave there. That's our ground." You're never going to please everybody, but if it can benefit the club financially and obviously the experience for the fans, and it's done in the right way, in the right manner, I don't see people would have too much of a problem. But you're right. I think if they still kept the St. James's part bit, people would be happy because we would all call it St. James's. It'd only really be the yeah, media yeah. Uh, and, and obviously at the top of it. We're, we're still saying we're going to St. James's at the weekend. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Julie's question. Uh, Julie Baker, another regular, followed us right from the start. Uh, what does Warren make of the way certain fractions, press, other groups, organisations seem to be sig sig signalling out uh, NUFC fans post takeover? I think there's a little bit of ironic jealousy uh, there. I mean, again, it's people of going with another story that obviously needs to be spoken about. You know, we're not going to say about the human rights and whatever's gone. But as I said before, early on in this programme, the Premier League set out rules and regulations about the new ownership and consortium. And we ticked every box because otherwise we wouldn't be allowed to, to have the new ownerships. So, again, there's going to be a lot of jealousy, even with the six clubs or the clubs that are saying, well, you can't spend the money. And <laughs> don't tell me that Man City haven't been doing the same thing. PSG <laughs> haven't been doing this. So, don't, you know, and other clubs have been making... Uh, revenue by selling, you know, names as well. Manchester United have got 26 sponsors. So how can they talk about things? They've they've given their sales to everybody. Um, so from that point of view, I think for, for Newcastle, 
it's part and parcel of what's come over it. It's jealousy because, like I said, we've got 300 billion. It is what it is. <laughs> you must have been watching uh, our shows, Robin, because uh, yeah. that, that's, <laughs> that's what we exactly said. What we've been I, like I, was the only, I was the only one. There was one of us. <laughs> <laughs> it was you. It was you. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Warren. Um, question from Tom, another regular to the show. Uh, Warren, who would you like to have as manager of Newcastle United? Apart from myself and Alan. Um, yeah. Well, this is an audition. <laughs> this, this series is is a is a we we're actually working on behalf of Amanda Stavely and, and the consortium. To pick. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No, I, you know, there's there, there's some wonderful names that's been mentioned, and obviously Brendan Rodgers was one of them earlier on, but he ruled himself out. And Eddie was another player, uh, another coach um, uh, as well. With there's lots of people that have been. Antonio Conte at the moment, if you're asking, but someone's available. He's a winner. He understands the league. Um, Negglesman, who I love at, at Dortmund, who's forward thinking, uh, likes young players, tactically is aware. Uh, Pochettino, um, you know, when it first spoke about with him, I mean, the job that he did with Spurs, look what's happened to them now. He's left. Um, yeah. He wouldn't be everybody's, you know, cup of tea, how he's going. But you know what it is, guys? It's lovely that we're speaking in these type yeah. of coaches. It's not <laughs> thinking, well, who can we really on the list? Yeah, yeah. Who can we try and persuade someone who's just been sacked or you know out of a work to try? There's a, there's a direction of where we've got going, and I think these these coaches that we've looked at have got to understand that they're going to work with a technical director. They're going to work with you know someone that's going to um, a, a football uh, director of football that's going to help them out as well. So it's just lovely to be able to be optimistic and look at someone that's forward thinking, that's going to train, that's got an idea of what the the history and the DNA of the club and how can you transform that onto a field so when the fans walk in they want to be entertained they want to be excited about their team going forward and they want them to win there's no doubt they want them to win you know Mourinho was spoken about and you know would that be the right mixture at the moment maybe because it's so desperate he would be but I think if we look bigger picture then I think we want someone who's got that that mindset you know look what Thomas Tucker has done to to, to Chelsea, yeah. tactically aware, you know, good man management. The, the game has evolved, you know, this this old school mentality, you still need to have that foundation, but you also need to be in with the times and, and going forward and, and what make play, uh, players tick and how can you identify players. You, you have a foundation, but like I said, with Sir Bobby, he would treat everybody different, you know, in, in their own way and find out what makes someone tick. It's interesting you mentioned, uh, mentioned Nagelsmann because both myself and Pete, we do grassroots coaching and stuff like that. So we look at other coaches to like pick ideas off and we have numerous different chats about it. Now, when they mentioned our director of football, sport and director, one person that came with us was Ralph Ranyak as a director of football. He's got a great philosophy. And I think my dream team, if I don't think we'd ever be able to get it now, one, because he's just started a project at Bayern Munich. But I think, you know, three, four years down, five years down the line, you had Rannick a director and then Nagelsmann as your head coach. I think that's your dream team, basically. I don't know what you would think on something like that, Warren. Yeah, no, with Ralph, he did a, at Leipzig, did a great job, you know, identifying coaches, you know, understand what the plan was at Leipzig and how they was going to do it with Red Bull and Schalzberg and, and all the different clubs who so understood the philosophy that he was doing. He did take the reins for a little bit, uh, but obviously made it clear he didn't want to do that and they was quite successful. Um yeah, yeah, I mean, that would be an ideal combination because, like I said, you, you've got to have a really good relationship with a technical director. Um, and it was in like Ajax, like I know Mark Overmars has been spoken about uh, as well yeah. coming in from Ajax. Mark has got his office right close to the, the manager. So they actually see each other. And I think that's important to have that relationship rather than he's in one building and you're in another building and no one knows where everybody is. So... You know, I think that's another area um, that we need to make sure that we've we, we've got entail. So, listen, it's lovely to have this and that there's a plan. And I'm sure the ownership yeah. group are, are looking at all these avenues and listening to all different ideas. Um, and now it's their job to get it right. So I'm surprised they didn't actually try and look at Rannick as a interim coach to then, like, with a view to move upstairs because obviously you can get the philosophy going and then they he could bring think, a coach who yeah. those would work under afterwards. Yeah, they might still be doing it. I know you hear in the media it's done, it's not happening. But, you know, that what they did with, with Jonesy is give him the two games to give themselves some time as well. Yeah, I think that was a big thing. It wasn't like, 
well, it's an audition for you and see how you go. It was like, we need a bit of time. And we know someone that is a good coach, knows the Premier League, knows the players. So that's that's not just rip it all out straight away. Keep doing what you're doing. You picked up a point with the atmosphere and the adrenaline. You might even beat this Chelsea team if you really go out and listen, they're a top team. But I understand if you can get that energy going like we had against Spurs and be tactically aware when we don't have the ball and when they have the ball, how are you going to close them down? We might even get a positive result against them. It gives you a little bit more time to, to try and bring people in. They won't stop working until they get the identify the right person. Um, Warren, another question uh, from uh, Seb. Uh, how do you compare the dressing room atmosphere at Wimbledon and, and Newcastle? Now, I did I did hear uh, yeah, the, the, the crazy gang uh, references here. I did hear in another part I was, uh, did, I was doing a bit of research, and uh, was uh, you said you said that, that the owner slashed your, your tires at one stage. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Sam, Sam man, I, I, I got picked for England and uh, we, I went out to train. I come to my car, I had a Saab at the time and uh, all my tyres had been slashed. So I was like, you know, I've just been picked for England. You, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, the lads have done. I said so to Vinny, I said, you're out of order. I, I can't afford four new tyres. You've slashed them. He went, I never did it. So I went to Fash. I went, John Fasher, you, why did I never did it? And it was Sam, a man, the owner that had gone out there and slashed my tyres. So I'm, I'm having a go at Vinny Jones, which is, a stupid thing to do anyway and John Fashion. <laughs> it was actually the owner of the football club. But saying that, you know, the only thing that was different at Wimbledon, we would obviously set pairs, clothes on fire. We would we lock someone in a, a boot once of a car. You know, we would do a bit crazy. But as a team spirit, and I think you've seen that picture when the boys would go out at Newcastle when we'd go and have pasta and a few drinks on a, a Sunday night or a Monday night. We was all there. And that's the same spirit that we had at Wimbledon. We still have a, uh, a WhatsApp now and there's about 25 players on it. Newcastle, we have the same with the WhatsApp with Shay and, and, and Ga Ga I was going to say Gary there, but with, with Rob and, and Alan, we, we communicate on WhatsApp. So there was quite a, a spirit of that. And I, I don't want to say, but because of my personality, when say Nobby or Alan Gomo or Lauren Robert, I would make sure we'd all go out together. So it's part of my, yeah, I was like the entertainment manager. I'd make sure they was comfortable. And I bought that chemistry and spirit from Wimbledon to Newcastle and the lads already had it at Newcastle the, and let Steve Watson Lee Clark will be in it don't need to tell you that they they, <laughs> they like they enjoy socializing together so to bring me into it and Les and Bez and Rob Lee and, and everybody else that we had you know 15 18 of us that would all go out and, and make sure we was together and then obviously as we got older that we'd go out with the kids and things like that so there was a quite a few things that was quite similar in that change room in both of them except for locking people in in back of cars and setting their clothes on fire which i don't think les would have been too happy if i set his amani suit and david Ginola <laughs> cut cut his suit up in in to pieces and things like that so but it was all fun and games cheers warren um i think this is the question you identified uh, chris as a good one to ask um from from jeff uh, Warren, how important do you think your goal against Newcastle was for your career? My goal against Newcastle? No, I think they'd already made their mind up. They see me at she Kevin said to me, he'd see me at Sheffield Wednesday, um, and he made his mind up there. So I think we played Wimbledon played Newcastle a little bit after that. So he'd already made his mind up. So yeah, I don't think that had any difference. I missed the penalty. Maybe that done it as well because I, 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 Pavel saved the penalty. So maybe that was that. That was what uh, that got me got me off the hook. But yeah, fellas, I don't need to cut this short. But I do need to in the like, next five minutes or so. You know, I could talk nope, forever. No, and I, no, listen, I'd love I'd love to be on once you've got more people on. I'd love to come on, but I I, I have got things to do today. No. Nope. No problem, Warren, because yeah, we would keep you here all night if we had our chance. <laughs> but uh, no, um, I think we, we will actually wrap up there. Um, yeah, the, there was loads of questions. Apologies to anyone. Go on, just ask me one questions. last one. Go on, one, one last, last one. one. So okay. Yeah, go on. Um, you can get in trouble for asking the question. <laughs> you can pick one up. Uh, Make okay, sure it's um, played. <laughs> <laughs> Rami said some nice things about my, my pictures today, so I'm going to give him the, the question. How important is it to work on the on the academy and bring up talented lads with NUFC uh, DNA? It's vital. You know, we can't lose out on Alan Shearer again or Michael Carrick. Um, these, it's a hard, it's a hard job, but you've got such a hotbed of of young, uh, talented players up there. 
uh, they need to be put in the right environment. Um, they need to go forward. But yes, it is vital because uh, you know, I'm trying to think of the last, you know, uh, you know, obviously got the two brothers that have come through. Um, but when you're talking about like the, when you had Steve Watson, Lee Clark, they was all coming through. Um, yeah, it's, it's vital. It's a big, big part of, of the of the of the club uh, and something that we should really be mindful of, of looking, making sure the young players identify and uh, eight, nine, ten year olds and make them feel part of the club and what the future is going to be. Uh, make them come to the stadium, make them watch, live their dream, uh, watching the next uh, top class player that they want to go and, and be part of it. So, yeah, I think there's a big, big connection there. Cool. Cheers, Warren. I'm uh, just going to give a quick shout out to our sponsors who are Central Ale. And of course, Chris, you got to visit uh, Bruce, the only Bruce that's still left in. Uh, <laughs> there he is, Bruce, checking out uh, Colin, Colin Tum in uh, Central Station, and he will sort you out. Um, Warren, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, anyone that hasn't subscribed, make sure to, to subscribe to the channel as well. Uh, we're heading where we're now we're he, trying to head towards 2k subscribers. You know where to go and hit that that subscribe button at the bottom. Um, Warren, thanks for being our first legend. Uh, hopefully not our last legend, but our first no. legend to join us. And uh, thanks, thanks for, for coming on and having a chat. It was it was really good and uh, great to have someone that's whose posters adorned my 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 walls uh, when I was growing up uh, uh, to, to have on, on with us. So uh, thanks a million. Absolutely. Much pleasure, appreciate, Warren. Warren. Yeah, thanks a lot. And again, we appreciate all the support you give. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Amazing. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Warren. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Right, everybody. You. We'll say goodbye. Good night, even. Take care. Bye-bye. See you later, Good night, guys. Good luck.